Hey everyone, my name is Amanda Milberg. I'm a senior partner sales engineer at DataIQ. And today I'm gonna to talk about the power of DataIQ and Databricks. So to start, by show of hands, who here has heard of the Cronut? Cool. So the Cronut was invented here in New York in 2013 at Dominique Ansel Bakery in Soho, New York. And the Cronut is simply a combination of a croissant and a donut. And after its inception, it was a total hit, with over 300 people lining up each day outside to get one of these items. And today, the cronut is one of the most talked about desserts in history, truly showing that one plus one equals three. And while these two products were great on their own, the croissant and the donut, magic can happen when you mix the two together. I like to think we have this magic when we talk about Data IQ and Databricks using Data IQ as the best-in-class visual interface on top of your infrastructure of choice, in this case, the Databricks Lakehouse. Data IQ and Databricks brings AI capabilities to your business teams, enabling all personas in your organization to scale your analytics initiative with secure and safe access to the Databricks Lakehouse in the easy-to-use visual interface of Data IQ. So let's take a look at some of these feature integrations. First, we're able to read and write data directly to the lake house. We're also able to load data from cloud storage into the lake house. For your data engineers, you can write, write SQL code that will be execute using the computational power of Databricks. For your business analyst, all visual recipes created in Data IQ will have the computation pushed down to your Databricks cluster. Data scientists, they can write Python code too. With Databricks Connect, we're able to execute this computation also on the Databricks cluster. For your machine learning engineers, they're able to train models in Data IQ, and the scoring of these models will also be pushed down to Databricks. The best part is, as you read and write data to Databricks, we're fully integrated with Unity Catalog, which means security, governance, and lineage is preserved. And our momentum is in full swing. Since being announced Data IQ as the Databricks AI Partner of the Year in June, we've continued our momentum, now going into the generative AI space. So I'm excited to announce that we now have a, an integration to the Mosaic ML models that allows you to connect to those LLMs inside Data IQ. So let's look at a demo. So now, can play it. <laughs> oh, sorry, it wasn't playing down there. Um, so now with Mosaic ML, you're able to connect to models within Data IQ. You're able to select which groups have the access to the security. Now, in a flow, we can read and write data from the lake house. Here we have customer review sentiments. Using Prompt Studios, we're able to iterate on these prompts, connecting to our Mosaic ML models. When we're content on this output, we can save this as a recipe to our flow, again, writing that data back to the lake house. This shows this integration and this partnership goes beyond AI initiatives to generative AI. And now, to talk further about these integrations, I'd like to invite Jed and Barry on stage to talk to you a little bit more about Data IQ and Databricks. How's it going? I feel like we should have brought cronuts. Does anybody, anybody want one? I know there's a lot of amazing French treats. I didn't fully appreciate how good the Data IQ conference would be. We need to up our game at Databricks. Yeah, we do have a lot of good food here, yeah. right? Uh, and I think the cronut concept, right, that's a, a French uh, combined with an American dessert. Put together. That's why it's so good. Right, yeah, like our team. Best of both worlds. <laughs> uh, you want to introduce yourself, Barry? Yeah, so Barry Dauber. I'm probably one of the newest employees at Databricks. So I was actually ran sales and business development partnerships at Mosaic ML. Uh, I was there for about a year and a half before the very uh, exciting acquisition by Databricks. But I've been in the ML, data science, NLP space the last seven or eight years. Um, and I knew that Mosaic, we really had a chance at making it. The team was phenomenal when I joined, which led me to go there. But uh, when I first started, I was 
selling neural network training and you know we were getting some good traction but I knew we made it when I was talking to my mom on the phone she calls and she's an avid reader of the New York Times and I'm like I just read about this chat GPT are they competitive with you guys at Mosaic and I was like holy moly mom a, that's amazing that you made the bridge between ChatGPT and what I do at Mosaic. That means I explained it well enough for you to understand. And B, no mom, OpenAI is not really competitive to us. But you know, there's some fringe things where it is. But if anything, like, and I've said you know, to this day now, ChatGPT has been one of the best marketing things I've ever had. So thank you, OpenAI. We, we very much appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been good for all of us, right? Um, <clears throat> I'll do a quick introduction to myself. I'm Jed Doherty. I'm VP Platform Strategy at DataIQ. Uh, I like to tell people that I'm the longest running American employee of DataIQ, despite the uh, French reference to croissants. Uh, I still don't speak French after eight years. But uh, I'm super happy to have been working with Databricks over the last couple of years to create this integration. Um, really looking forward to, to building more here in the future. Yeah, us too. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start by maybe asking you dive in a little bit deeper about what made Mosaic so attractive to Databricks. This was obviously a huge move by them in the market, and I really, maybe you can tell us a little more about, yeah, what drove that? Yeah, definitely, and I mean, some of it is, you know, all joking aside, you know, thank you, ChatGPT, and the rise of large language models and Gen AI and computer vision and imagery models in general, but props to Naveen and Hanlon and Jonathan and our founding team on building an incredible team that focused on efficiency. So when I joined Mosaic, we were the efficient ML company, and you'll see um, stickers floating around. And what efficient ML meant at the time, and still means to me today and to our team and, and now to Databricks, is when we're talking to customers, customers think that training a model is crazy expensive, right? You hear about OpenAI and Anthropic and Cohere talking about how it's tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to train these models. And in reality, yeah, training you know, GPT-4 and ChatGPT cost $100 million or whatever it is. It's a lot of money. But every enterprise doesn't need that model when you're looking at contract data or when you're looking at um, you know, the example that Amanda had before. You're looking to do classification of content. So what we set out to do early on was how do you lower the cost of training these models? So the efficiency initially was how do you lower the cost of training these models so you get the most value per flop? How do you make it so instead of costing you know, $10,000 to train this model, it costs six or $7,000? How do you make it so instead of taking you know, a day, it takes half a day? How do you do it instead of over lunch, you're doing it over coffee? And what sorts of use cases and savings can you now do where we can now actually walk into an enterprise and be able to go sell an actual end-to-end -end model for the cost of you know, an enterprise POC. So we started doing this efficiency. We expanded to do orchestration. It turns out, shocking to probably nobody who's tried to train a model, training a large language model is really, really hard. Uh, NVIDIA's done a great job building amazing accelerators, and there's other partners of ours as well, AMD and Intel that we work with to go train these models, but orchestration across many, many GPUs, and you hear in the news about OpenAI taking literally every GPU from Azure, right? Tens of thousands of GPUs. Running training jobs across tens of thousands of GPUs, or thousands of GPUs, or even tens of GPUs, is really hard. It takes a lot of orchestration, a lot of manual intervention. So we expanded what I view as the, the definition of efficiency of how do you go from just training quicker, faster, cheaper, to how do you make this easy so a human can go do it right the first time? Uh, so that's where we just made it really easy and affordable for people to train these models. And if you expand the efficiency, and to answer your question directly now, with Databricks, what Databricks did initially, you know, rewind 10 years ago, 10 plus years ago, with Spark, they did a lot of work on Spark on the CPUs, right? How do you orchestrate across lots and lots of compute to go process insane amounts of data? At Mosaic, we do something very similar, although our hardware accelerator, for the most part, and I realize I'm overly trivializing, our hardware accelerator is mostly GPUs, right, or exclusively GPUs. So how can you go do the same sort of orchestration for these ridiculously large data sets at scale? And then what was exciting about Databricks for us and you know, why I think the marriage makes so much sense is Databricks has the full end-to-end -end platform, and Amanda talked about it with Unity Catalog, 
Governance is probably one of the most popular things I was asked about when talking to you know big regulated industries and Fortune 500s. They're like that's awesome, I'm going to train this model, but how do I know where the data is coming from? How do I know where it's going? How do I know how people are accessing it? How do I, you know, all the questions lineage that you get asked and you ask vendors like ours. And Databricks had already built all this, right? They already had the data storage uh, with Lakehouse. They already have the model serving. They already had a lot of the explainability and experiment tracking with MLflow. And we solved a very specific little tiny hole that I think Data, Databricks had on how do you do this at scale? So Databricks obviously did it well with Dolly. You know, that was a smaller model and kind of showing some really great results with fine tuning. But how can you do this at scale with large models? We started coming up with the MPT 7B, which I think still maybe to this date, somebody will have to correct me, is the most downloaded, I think, 7 billion parameter model ever. Um, put in perspective, and apologies, it's a long answer. Uh, put in perspective, we had an internal debate, and don't tell anybody I told you all. You're all my 200 closest friends. We did an internal debate. We're like, you know what? If this hits 50,000 downloads in a month, we're going to be really freaking excited. Like two weeks in, you know, we're on Slack looking at the Hugging Face downloads. I think we were like two or three million. And we're like, well, if we're playing prices right rules, anybody who'd guessed 50,000 would have won. They would have been way off, but we, we would have been close. closest, but still lower. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. So I, I think just the, and then you, you back up, and we were just talking about this on the side of the stage. Cultural fit and uh, you know just technology fit are huge in acquisitions. And when Naveen, the Mosaic CEO, and Ali, uh, the Databricks CEO, started talking, I think they just realized that there was just so much similarity, both in the products and the culture of the company, and kind of the alignment of where we wanted to go, that it was a no-brainer. Love it. Uh, so to dive in a little bit deeper about when you need to train versus when you can use an off-the-shelf LLM. Uh, at Data IQ, we've been working with lots of customers who are in the early to middle stages of rolling out LLMs inside their organization. And constantly, that's the question they're coming to us with, right? Is, okay, maybe there's four levels here of uh, challenge when trying to deal with LLMs. And maybe the very simplest one is I go get an a API key from you know, one of the providers and I start hitting uh, their API, throwing text at it, and getting responses back. Like that's like 20 lines of Python code, right? Or it's a you know a single GUI screen inside of Data IQ. Uh, below that is maybe I want to uh, run a private LLM, uh, something off of Hugging Face or something like that. I want to run it either on my servers, I want to run it on Mosaic, uh, but I don't need to retrain anything. Uh, maybe I want to do rag on top of that, so I want to put my own data sets into it or my own pieces of uh, text into it and be able to query that. Uh, that's maybe a level three, so I'm adding my own information to the process. Uh, and then level four is either fine tuning or actually training. And like, what percentage of use cases do you think fall into that level four? Uh, is it you know 95? Is it five? Uh, somewhere in between? Uh, Price is right rules. <laughs> Price is right, that's good. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that assessment of how kind of it stacks out. And I, I think it's interesting that it, the answer that I learned early in my consulting days, I'll say to some practitioners from the- Don't the say firm, it depends. Yeah, yeah is it, it varies. Uh, I was gonna say it depends, thank you, Jed. Uh, it, it depends on the size of the company to a degree and what you're trying to do. So it's interesting for us, and I'll answer the question. So for us, when I have startups that approach us, so we're working with, a technology company called 12 Labs, and I'll only use examples we're allowed to talk about publicly. So 12 Labs is building a video search company. Really exciting, like they're, you see them on the charts for Gen AI companies all the time. They needed a video transformer to be able to go build their video search product. They couldn't rely on somebody else to do it, and they knew they had to do it from scratch. So they come in, need to spin up an insane number of GPUs, and pre-train from scratch. What's been interesting is talking to like the heavily regulated industries and the Fortune 500s, you know, enterprises of the world, is they're still going down that kind of path to learn. Most people today that I talk to, and now thank you Databricks, I talk to all of the biggest Databricks customers, which is a lot easier to get in the door than when you're a little scrappy startup, so thank you Databricks. Um, they're kicking the tires on OpenAI. And OpenAI is an absolutely fantastic solution. And going back to what I said earlier, I don't think we really compete head to head. And the example, my boss, or the 
Mosaic CEO Naveen always said, as an example, was, you know, if you want to know what led to the fall of Rome or like how is the um, Great Wall of China built or the examples I always use, you know, it's kind of rainy in New York City today. What are top five restaurants I should go to and then where should I go do afterwards? OpenAI, you want a $100 million model to go answer that question. But you as Bank of X or, you know, Enterprise Y, that's not a question you're probably going to be asking. You want to know, looking at my 10 or, you know, 50 years of loan applications or contracts or lots of text or I run a help desk as part of I'm a big bank, how do I make sure my decades of support tickets and all of the books and product descriptions are included in my responses? You can train a much smaller model for a fraction of the cost to go do that. So what we typically do is I look for people who are kicking the tires on OpenAI or one of the other kind of privately hosted models because I know there's some sort of hopeful business value and use case there. And then it's, okay, do you care about where that data came from? Do you care about where that data is going? Do you care about what it was trained on? Do you want it trained on your own data? Do you want to serve it cheaper? And depending on where they fall on that pendulum, uh, we start to walk it down. And then within a large organization, I think there's going to be a place for every single one of those depending on the use case and the data sets they have. Yeah, if you want to know what led to the fall of Rome, OpenAI massive model is amazing. But if you want to understand, you know, give me the top 10 accounts that had these random uh, stipulations in their contracts, RAG probably won't work that well either. You're probably going to want to fine tune your own model or, or uh, pre-train from scratch a model to do that. Uh, an example, a real life example we trained with Stanford uh, last year just to put in perspective how much things cost. Are people familiar with PubMed? You know that data yes. set? Okay. So PubMed for those not. Yes, I am. Say yes. Sorry. That doesn't. Yeah. Could yeah. ask so, the audience. That's fair. So PubMed for the folks that aren't similar to Archive, if you know Archive, Archive or uh, PubMed is a life sciences kind of biotech uh, publication repository owned by the National Institute of Health in the United States specifically the National Library of Medicine, has decades of content. So most of it now, thank you, uh, some big corporate America, is behind paywalls, but you're able to get access to full content. So we found all 10 million documents that were full, docu full text. 10 million documents, we said, okay, let's go train a PubMed, we initially called it PubMed GPT, but I think OpenAI is trademarking GPT, so if you look on the Mosaic website, it's now called Biomed LM. But we trained it from scratch. It took a few days, 2.3 billion parameters uh, model. It cost us like thirty to $38,000. So that's what we'd charge a customer for that model. You know, again, cost of a POC, and the initial goal of this, we, we trained this with Stanford Center for uh, Foundation Models. And the goal of this model initially was, let's go have it try to pass the US medical licensing exam. Really hard test that doctors in the United States take to go become doctors and be fully licensed. And you know the TLDR is the model didn't pass, but the model was only trained on basically you know, publications related to biotech and life sciences. And then of course Google a couple weeks later uh, came out with a much larger model was trained on both the questions and the answers to the US medical licensing exam. So it, it passed. Did pass. It did pass, but it cost you know a gazillion times more. That's right. the exact scientific number. So, so I think it's really interesting what the point I think you're, that you're making, or one of the points you're making here, is that you know you really do need to analyze at a use case by use case level and choose the right model or the right serving mechanism uh, at the use case uh, perspective. Uh, I, I was wondering in the audience, uh, how many people here saw the the keynotes this morning? Do is that some of them? All right. How many people remember the term LLM mesh? Okay. So I I think I think the point that that, that Barry's making here really ties into that is that. The reality, when I talk about LLM mesh, what I'm kind of speaking about is that you are going to have, you're not going to have a single LLM that solves all the problems in your organization, especially if it's a large enterprise organization with you know, dozens of different teams doing many different things across LLMs. You're going to have many different ones deployed. Some are just going to be APIs, many are going to be trained your own, or some are going to be fine-tuned, and they're going to be running across a wide range of different platforms. Having a cohesive service layer on top of those, uh, which is what DataIQ provides, makes it so that you can keep the governance 
of these different LLMs for the different use cases controlled. You can keep access controlled. You can keep costs controlled. That's really how you tie all of this work together. Uh, we're super excited to be working with Mosaic and with Databricks to, to do just that. Uh, I, to finish off here, um, I, th I think we're almost at time. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the future, uh, which obviously roadmap, et cetera, et cetera, NDA. Um, but do we see Mosaic and Databricks, um, you know, putting out two different types of LLMs or putting out two different types of offerings? Do we think that's going to become all one thing at some point in the future? What does that look like to us? Um, I think a lot of it, you know, is is behind NDAs and things, but things that I could probably talk about publicly is it'll definitely, I mean, we are integrated. I was on a call with a massive bank this morning. They're like, we want the exact roadmap dates of when we're going to get all these things. So yeah, right now, in, in full transparency, right, you, you're a Databricks customer, you're using everything there, you got Data IQ running on top of that. Mosaic's a, an add-on. We will get consumed into the GUI, into the user interface. Currently, Mosaic's a command line interface tool. It's definitely for an ML engineer. But what's amazing about you know, the integration into Databricks and, and working with Data IQ is we really open up the number of people that are able to utilize it, right? How do you get business users building kind of the mapping of where that data came, comes from and how they go train that model off yeah. of it? How do you get the data lineage via Databricks? And then how do you still get that model actually trained? Right. It's going to be a lot more of a unified workspace to be able to go do that. So I think it'll be a lot more turnkey than it is now versus, hey, sign up here and sign up here. And together, you'll get one bill, but it'll be two different applications as they slowly migrate together. Or quickly, quickly <laughs> migrate together. <laughs> At some speed, migrate together. It makes a lot of sense. Um, with the last couple minutes here, uh, I wanted to see if there's any open questions from the audience. We have uh, probably take two or three questions if anybody. Uh, oh, yeah, sir. Thank you. Sorry. Hi there. Great talk so far. Thank uh, you. Question about uh, when you mentioned about training the PubMed model, right, and the cost being 38000 What are some of the parameters or the best practices for estimating what the cost would be before actually going through? and training a, a model and a subset of data. Yeah, so it comes down to, it's basically time on a GPU, right? So going back to, we try to lower the cost per flop. How do we train that model as quickly as possible so the cost goes down? But the things for you to think about is the amount of data, the number of tokens that are part of that model. So obviously less data is gonna be a cheaper model. The other thing that you can do and Jed was talking about this, is you can fine tune, or we actually like to say is continue to train. So you can take a Llama 2 or an MPT7B or 30B and continue to train a couple hundred billion tokens on your data. And what we like to say at Mosaic, now Databricks is we lower the cost of experimentation. Because oftentimes, like, let's be honest, the LLM space is crazy new. We don't know the exact data mix. It's going to make for the perfect model. I can ensure that the model will train right the first time. But if you train with bad data and you're going to get a bad model. And that's, again, where Databricks comes in, which is a huge value to us. But it's, it comes down to the data mix and then how you want to think about that and the amount of, number of tokens or words or documents uh, that are part of that model. But we can help you scope how much it would cost. <laughs> All right, uh, another question here. Hi, uh, my name is Jay Corada, and I'm from uh, AbV. I have a question related to the licensing of uh, DataIQ and Databricks. I was not aware of your marriage. Uh, by the way, <laughs> congratulations. Hi. Yeah. We'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So the thing is, uh, currently we have Databricks license and also Data IQ. And uh, say, suppose my company is planning to phase out Databricks. But we have many models sitting on Databricks. So if we buy Data IQ license, do we get data access to Databricks free of cost? Or should we have two separate licenses for both Data IQ and Databricks? Yeah, so you'll still need to pay Databricks for compute. Data IQ will be the access layer that your users leverage to, to uh, run that underlying compute. Um, all data that's already in Databricks is going to be accessible through Data IQ uh, and vice versa. I see. So we need not worry about uh, the existing code that is sitting on Databricks. Yeah, that, that's, you don't have to move that or migrate that in any way. I see. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any other questions? Silence reigns over the crowd. <laughs> Um, I, oh, There's one sorry. in the back, I think. LLMs from Databricks, and I was curious um, if you guys had any future uh, plans to uh, make the uh, 
process of getting uh, that chat GPT feel uh, easier um, w within Databricks. So when you mentioned chat GPT feel, to dive into that a little bit more, are, are you talking about like the chat ch chatbot type interface or? Yeah. Um, so I, that, that's a very good question. It's probably outside of my knowledge. I, uh, I can make a point to it, actually. Yeah. Uh, so, so one, one nice thing that uh, DataIQ provides is that if you have an API access to an underlying model, uh, you can deploy a web app with, with one click that will provide a chat interface to that underlying API. So as long as it, the underlying tech is, you know, can respond to questions no matter which kind of API you're hitting. Um, it's really just that back and forth interface. Both DataIQ, you can play a web app that would be able to leverage that. You, you can. Yeah, you can. DataIQ does have a lang chain integration, but uh, it's behind the covers even. So it's even tri more trivial than that. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I think we'll wrap it up here. Thank you all so very much. And, and thanks very much, Barry, for coming to the conference. And, and thanks for Databricks for us. Uh, yeah, definitely. Here. Thank we you. We really appreciate you.